statement. If he did it once, he'll do it again. Amen? And I believe that he'll do it again and again and again because he's not a respecter of persons. And so it's always uh, a blessing to be able to hear praise reports of something that, you know, we, we put it at God's feet. We just trust him to do things that we're just not capable of doing. And then when he answers, whether it be immediately or even a year later or 10 years later, when he answers the impact of the confirmation that he, he heard our prayer and that he honored the prayer and that he answered the prayer. It's always a blessing, amen? So I just praise God for that. And so going forward, don't let the testimonies slip out of your fingertips. Because see, God may not have done something recently for you that you can tangibly say, this is what he recently had done for me. But the very fact that he has done something for someone else should let you know that you're just that much closer to the front of the line. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be encouraged because the line is moving. And as people get healed and blessed and answer, the prayers are answered, you're just being co pushed closer and closer to the front of the line for your turn and your season. And so rejoicing with those that rejoice. And mourning with those that mourn. Uh, it, there's something to that that gives you a little bit of favor in that line. Amen? Amen. 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 Glory to God. So I want to uh, talk to you guys today. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Um, and uh, we're going to go in there. And I want to look at some of the stuff here that God has for us today. Because we're in a season now where he's already made the promise that he's going to release some things in this season. But there are some things that we have to make sure we're on one accord with. Can somebody say one accord? One accord. We have to be on one accord because God does not move in division. Amen? Right. Amen. So I want to go through, we're going to start in chapter 2. And we're going to um, read verses 1 through 5. And I really like this text because there's some points in here that has really been burning my heart from the beginning of this ministry in reference to truly being one body in Christ. And so we're going to spend a few moments kind of going through here and I guess you could say picking the meat off the bones, if you will, right? Um, and then we're going to see what God has to say about it. So starting in verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement, this is the Amplified version. See, when you really want to get some all the meat, you go Amplify, because I'm telling you, it's so extra, y'all. It's so extra, but I love it. Therefore, if there is any encouragement and comfort in Christ, as there certainly is in abundance, if there is in, uh, any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship that we share in the spirit, if there is any great depth of affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love towards one another, knit together in spirit, intent on one purpose, and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. So what he's saying is if you have any of these things in you, if being united with Christ encourages you, if you have comfort from experiencing his love, choose if you have the same spirit as I do, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what God is doing, and I have that comfort, I have that love within me. If we share the exact same spirit of tenderness and compassion towards others, then nothing will please me more than if we be on one accord in our thoughts and our actions. Verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard others as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of of others. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard others as more important as yourselves. And it's pretty clear to me, and, and, and if I miss something, you guys, y'all feel free to correct me here, but we should value others above ourselves. And our ambition should not be to exalt ourselves, but we should be willing to prosper in valuing others more than we value ourselves. Are y'all with me this morning? Yeah. Is that something that, did y'all get that from that scripture? Yeah. I want to make sure I'm in the book. 
So if I want to prosper in anything, it should be in valuing you more than valuing myself. And I know that sometimes we get caught up in, well, I, I was taught to love myself. And as I'm not saying you're not supposed to love yourself, because the Bible actually says to love others more than you love yourself, so it's okay to love yourself. But sometimes we kind of get caught up in this thing where, hey, listen, I only get one life, so maybe I should just do me. And in my spare time, and if I have time, and if it's convenient, then maybe I'll decide if I'm going to do help and work for someone else. But if I choose not to, it's all right, because God loves me anyway. Y'all see what I'm saying? And sometimes we carry that mindset that, you know, my priority is me. See, see, when I look at my priority list, my name has to be at the top of it. Because that's how I was raised, that's how I was taught, and you know what, if I wasn't raised that way, that's just how I feel. Because see, if I put myself out there and make myself vulnerable, you might hurt me. Come on, somebody. And I don't want to be hurt again, so if I just take care of myself, then I can guard my heart and not have to worry about being hurt from lending a helping hand and getting nothing in return. Y'all with me this morning? I don't want to lose nobody. And so sometimes people carry that mindset and they try to find the scripture somewhere to justify that I should take care of me. You ever, you ever done that before? I know it's got to be somewhere in here, something that's going to tell me what I want to hear so I don't have to listen to the other part of the Bible that is also true. So that's why we have verse 4 and 5. It says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests. It kind of clears all that confusion up, doesn't it? <laughs> Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And have the same attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus. Look to him as your example in selfless humility. So it is okay to have goals and activities in your personal life. But when those things have a habit of being your go-to, whenever... The body of Christ, whether it be the church or just someone in the community, is calling for your presence at something that is outside of Sunday service. I'm about to mess with y'all for a minute. See, because we got to touch on oneness and what it really means. Oneness. Valuing others above ourselves. And sometimes the rubber meets the road Monday morning. Can, can we be honest for a minute? And, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and when people are calling on you to do things, whether it be for, you know, for the ministry, or whether it be for, just in general, for someone else. You should have caught me on Sunday when you had me at church. Come on, somebody. But see, I got my own thing that I'm doing. See, Monday through Saturday, that's my time. That's my time. Don't mess with me on my time because that's my time. On Sunday, if you need me, you catch me from 11 to 1.15. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. 1.16 is going to be kind of iffy. 1.17, forget about it. But he's saying right here in the Word, he says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So this is a mindset and a shift of a mindset that we have to take in order to have the same attitude. And I love this correlation here because what they're saying is when you take on the mindset of a value, of valuing others more than you value yourself, you're actually taking on the mindset of Christ. Amen. There's no confusion in that. There's no way to kind of cross-reference it and try to find it to be false. They're saying have this same attitude in yourselves which was in Christ Jesus. So you're telling me that Christ was available on Monday afternoon. Christ was available Tuesday morning at 3 a.m. See, you can call Christ at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and say, I need you at 4.15 and he'll be there. So when we take on the mindset that, listen, I have to value you more than I value me because, see, I want to have the mind of Christ. See, now I'm more effective for the kingdom because even though I might have to work, See, that's the, and we, all, we all work with people here, right? Most of us anyway. Some of us might be retired. God bless you. I love y'all. I'll be there one day. But if we have things that's already on our schedule, sometimes it's just understood, don't bother me because my office hours are from 9 
to the five. So don't bother me in between those times because that's when I'm at work. And I've shared this before, and I don't mind sharing it again. And whether y'all mind hearing it again, that's, that's on y'all, but I don't mind sharing it again. See, one thing that I've learned as I try to be as close to God as possible is that, you know, regardless of what I have on my schedule, if there is a call and a need for me to be somewhere, I'm going. I used to teach. And this is a story that just some of y'all have heard before. I used to be a teacher. I was in the classroom. And if I got a text message, which I have got several text messages while I was teaching, hey, listen, I really need, I need to talk to you. I had a teenager. Well, a guy, he was like 19. He had just graduated from high school. He was suicidal. He had tried to kill himself before. And his mom connected with me and said, I need you to really talk to this kid and pour into him because he's, I can't do nothing with him. So we, we spent a lot of time together. And he was doing well for a period of time, but then he went back. He backslid and went backwards, and then he texted me. He knew, first of all, he knew that he could reach out to me. That's a blessing. And so he reached out to me as I was at work, and he said, hey, listen, I'm not doing well. I really need to see you because I don't think I need to be here anymore. I don't see my purpose to be here anymore. Now, see, if I had the mindset that was not like Christ, can you hang in there until 3 o'clock? Can, can you just, just, just lay low and just be cool? I get off work at 3.30, I'll be there about 3.45. <laughs> he might not have been. He might not have made it. You see, there's a lot of situations like that. And I've, I've actually spoken with people who said, man, if I had just went when he called, he'd still be alive today. But see, taking on the mindset of Christ, see, I value you. I value your situation more then I value mine. And so there's absolutely nothing that will keep me from coming to your aid no matter what it is I'm doing. Y'all get quiet on me out there. And so this is the mindset that we're talking about here when we're talking about in unity, having a, uh, a fellowship of God's people who all think the same way. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Not having a, a group of people where there's maybe 20 or 30 and only one or two think that way, but all of them are saying, I'm a Christ follower. But having a group of people who all believe on the same accord that, listen, I am available to you no matter what day, no matter what night, no matter what it is, I'm coming if you call. And don't call me to say, hey, can you bring me some milk? You have to wait. My bad, don't call me about no milk. But if you're saying, hey, listen, I'm having an issue, I'm struggling, I don't know who to talk to, I pray, but I don't feel like God's hearing me. That happens. Sometimes people don't feel like God, I don't think he's hearing me. I just need somebody to touch and agree with me. Can you come through and pray with me? Absolutely. I'll be there. Because if I don't show up, guess who will? The enemy. If I don't take the call, Satan will. And so i got to make sure that because if I'm like-minded, and Christ understands the, the, the importance of being available, and so that's why he's, he's saying here in the scripture, in the text, that to be like Christ, having the same attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ. And that was an attitude that Christ had. That's the way I live. This is how I am. If you need me, I'm coming. And that's how we got to be. We got to get to that place. So that direct cor correlation is saying by placing the interests of God's people above my own, I'm carrying the same mindset of Christ. So when I look at my priority book, if your needs are at the top and my wants are at the bottom, I'm in the right place. But if I look at my priority book and my wants are at the top and your needs are at the bottom, come on, y'all can fill in the blank on that one. Come on, somebody. So we're in a dispensation of time that when we see more unity in the secular world than we do in the church. You guys can see all kinds of, of riots and up, uprisings of different communities, different groups and organizations. I mean, they're all together on one accord, believing the same thing. You can say, you can ask this person a question, they'll have an answer. You go somewhere else, ask somebody else a question, they'll have the same answer. They're all on one accord. The secular world is in so much of a unity right now that it's hard to move them. It's, you got to contend with them because they all believe something and they're so sold out about what they believe that you got to take note of what's going on. Even if, whether it's biblical or not, they still believe it and they're all on one accord. And so, this is where we are. If we cannot intentionally, one household at a time, say, hey, listen, we're going all in. We're going all in. Whatever it takes 
so that we are walking in unity. Whatever it takes for us to get to the next level as a family, whatever it takes to get to the next level as a church or as a body, whatever it takes, I'm all in. Because that's what a lot of people are doing. That's what the world is doing. They're all in for their cause. They're all in for their movement. But the church, we struggle with being all in. We struggle with being all in. I'm all in on Sunday. Am I, come on, somebody. Can I be? I'm all in as long as it's in this little time frame that, that, that you already put down on the paper that you said we're going to be meeting. Now, I'm all in for that, but don't, don't call on me for anything else because, see, that's not, I didn't sign up for extra. Y'all got to stay with me this morning. See, there was a time when churches didn't mix and mingle with other churches. And even now, it's still kind of that way. But within one church, they supported everybody to the extent of the world within that church. But if you didn't go to that church, they didn't fool with you. Y'all, anybody ever experienced that before? You try to get some fellowship going within another church, and they're like, no, oh, well, you go to what? No, we're not, we're good. We're not fellowship with y'all. And that was the dispensation of time that we were in at one point season, but now we're in a season where it's difficult to have fellowship within one church. Y'all with me this morning? It's difficult because we all have these little things. And so what's happening with, with, the, with the evil one? God, dog, it, it starts with, I got my thing. As long as I show up, as long as I pay my tithes, as long as I give me a couple hugs in, I've done my job. Right? And so, as long as I support those that are within this church, I've done my job. So even back then, we kind of missed what fellowship in the body is supposed to look like. The body is not this church. It's not comprised of just GRC. The body is all of God's children, all churches, whether they're in a church or not. If they're God's children, that's the fellowship that we're supposed to partake in. And so what ended up happening is it made sense for us to be strong, have a strong nucleus in this church and not fool with the other one. But see, that was the deception of the enemy. And what happened was he gives you that little bit and then you grow in that little bit of wisdom, or if you want to call it wisdom. And then next thing you know, he just gradually graduates you to the next little bit. You know what? You, you all did really good as a church, sticking together and doing your thing and not allowing other churches to get in. Now let's go ahead and form a little clique within the church. So the enemy's taking you here and trying to gradually bring you down bring it out to where you're isolated. And yeah, just get a little click within the church. You don't need to talk to everybody else. I mean, it's a big church. You ain't got to talk to everybody. Just talk to one or two people. And then within those one or two people, next thing you know, it's, now nah, I don't even want to deal with you because I don't like what you said the other day. And now you have all of these individual families, all these individual people in this big old church and there's no fellowship. And what we got to remember is that, see, the, the, the vision of all pastors is supposed to be something that unites everyone and it does God's work here on earth and it's supposed to work, y'all. Why? Because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the backing it, is backing it. But if you have division in the church, I don't care how good the vision is, division will tear it down. You can have one of the best visions anybody's ever seen, but if you've got a clique of people in the church that are not on one accord with the leader of that ministry, it's for nothing. Y'all with me this morning? And so God really wanted me to, to, I had something else in mind. He always does this to talk about. But he said, no, 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 this is the Sunday to speak on the power of oneness. Because there's an anointing that takes place when everyone is on one accord. And we're going to talk about that. But we have to come to a place, whatever church is your church home, there has to be a oneness within that church. Every member of that church, there's not just the leaders, every member of that church has to be on one accord. And I'm going to explain why in a little bit. So we have to be on one accord. God sends a pastor to lead a church. He'll send uh, an apostle, he'll send a bishop, he'll send a prophet. He sends different people for purposes. First of all, we have to come back to the place where we recognize this person was sent by God for a call. And if he was sent or if she was sent by God, then we got to follow in order for what it is God sent them to do to be accomplished. Okay? Went too far, didn't I? The power of oneness. No, actually, we're in a good place. We're in a good place. I'm going to stay right there. 
And so, moving forward, with this church as well as some other churches, it's, I believe that God wants to do an amazing thing, especially here. We've been praying for three, well, this church has been here for almost three years now. And from the beginning of time till now, we've been praying that God would just stir up some things in our heart that would cause us to be sold out for his purpose. And also send people. Because we're in a place, in a location where you're not necessarily able just to really be out in the valley, but as far as the location, people don't just drive by CGRCs in the corner. So that's why we have to get out in the community and do things, you know, uh, evangelist work and, and, and helping the homeless and do all these different things that God's called us to do. And so now this is a season where God is literally placing us in the season that we've been praying for. He's brought people to this ministry. He has fixed up the hearts of people that are in this ministry. And we're, the, we're literally at the doorstep of a breakthrough. And this is why God is saying, listen, 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 let's go back a minute and make sure that we're on one accord because, see, I cannot bless what is not unified. And that's why we're here today. We've got to have this conversation because he cannot bless what is not unified. And, and there are seasons that God moves in. And again, I don't have a calendar to figure out what season is what. I just know that I feel in my spirit when he's moving, I know that I need to be ready. Because he's going to move whether you're ready or not. And so what you don't want to do is see the move of God and miss it because you were not prepared. Because he moves. He moves. And if you're not prepared, it's not that he didn't move. It's just that you weren't ready to receive what it was he was doing. So there is power in unity. And God told me in my long time that this is the season of open doors, not only for this ministry, but for those who are like-minded in the body of Christ. So it's my duty to make sure that the church is spiritually conditioned for the overhaul of blessings that are about to come. So I think three of y'all heard that, so I'm going to say it again. God told me in my alone time that this is the season of open doors, not only for this ministry, but for those in the body of Christ that are like-minded. And it's my duty to make sure the church is spiritually conditioned for the overhaul of blessings that are about to come. Some of us may not have celebrated because I didn't say this is your season. This is your specific season. God is about to shine his grace on you. But sometimes we've got to remember that God will send a blessing indirectly to get right to you. See, if God is going to bless the ministry and he's going to bless those that are like-minded, just be one of those that are like-minded and you get blessed. So I don't have to call you by name and say God is about to do this thing in your life, but if you're like-minded, God says, I'm going to bless you because you're on one accord. So let's not miss the, the forest for the trees, amen? <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Oneness. Unity. This is where God's power is at its greatest. This is where God's power is at its greatest. And a lot of times we think that as long as the leadership staff is on one accord, everything else will follow. I'm not saying that's false, but it ain't true. <laughs> because how can a vision come to pass unless everyone is on board with the vision? Right? How can the vision come to pass if only the leaders are on board? Uh, their job is to just kind of help delegate and, and lead from their standpoint, but it has to take a collective effort for the vision to come to pass. So it's not always about just the leaders. And I'm waiting to find one church where everyone says, I'm sold out. I'm sold out. Whatever it is you're trying to do in the season, God don't do it without me. If whatever mission, whatever vision you've given the pastor, make it clear so that way I can follow. Whatever it takes, I don't want to miss it. I'm waiting to find one church where everyone in it is sold out to the point where God has no choice but to honor it and move. Oneness births unity. And this is where I want to talk about there's three stages of unity that I'm going to touch on real quick, and then we're going to get ready to close. So the first stage of unity is community. Community is important. So in Acts 4, 
32 and 7, we're going to talk about what community looks like when we're talking about the kingdom. Not the community over here. We're not talking about Thousand Trails community. Amen. We're not talking about these communities that you guys say. I'm talking about the kingdom community on earth, what it looks like. Acts 4, 32 through 37 says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. So they continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They kept on preaching God's word, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to go and sell something and bring the money to me. If you want to, you can. But that's not what I'm telling you to do. The big picture is community. Kingdom community. No one was ever in lack. No one had a need because they placed the, the value, they placed other people above their own desires. This happened after they had the encounter with the Holy Spirit. See, when, when they had the, the Pentecost movement, when, when the tongues fell down and rested on people, so they were transformed by a move of God, and from that point they realized something. Wait a minute. There's something different about me, and this difference is telling me that it's not about me. This difference is telling me that I, I should honor God's people by not making that my personal possessions my idols. Because we can be bound to our personal possessions. I, I, I can't do God's work because I gotta pay this mortgage and I gotta y'all come on somebody. We're gonna keep it real here for a minute, just for a little while, all right? I can't do what it is you want me to do because I have all these other things that I've got to take care of. But they realize that, you know what, I'm going to value others more than myself, even to a point with this beautiful land that I had purchased and I wanted to keep for myself. And I wanted to, like, you know, build a little nice little house on it. I, I had this land, but now after this encounter with Christ, I realized this land is not that important while they're over there starving, while these people over here have the need. So I'm going to sell my land. And I'm going to put the money at the apostles' feet so that we can do and distribute as needed so that way no one will be in lack. You guys have probably heard this scripture recently. It's because God keeps going back to this community thing with me and where we need to start thinking kingdom-minded. Oneness. No, this, yes, that's your house, but you're the kingdom community. So don't close yourself off in your house and isolate yourself from the rest of the kingdom because now you're no good to anyone else. Amen? The second one, see, when you start with community, it, it, it's, it's levels to this thing. So the very basis is, is community. Then we move up a little bit once we understand that. Once we get to that level where we recognize the power of community, it breeds opportunity. Opportunity. In Acts 2, 1 through 4, this is the Pentecost. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to do. See, when you have community of people that are on one accord, mighty things can happen. You have an opportunity to see the supernatural unfold right before your very eyes right here on earth. They literally saw what appeared to be tongues of fire that split up and it separated amongst everyone that was there and it rested on the people until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's not confuse being on one accord with being in the same place. So we, we got we to gotta go there for a minute. See, because a lot of times there's people that are in the same place, but they're not necessarily on one accord. Did y'all get that or did that go over somebody's head? Just because you're together does not mean that you're on one accord. I can prove it to you. 
There was, a, there was a point in time in the book of Job when God and Satan was having a conversation. Can you just imagine them in an office somewhere, sitting down, Satan came in, in, in God's office, and God is asking him, hey man, where you been? Yeah, I know that scripture, right? It actually had, it actually had some conversation. What, hey, Satan, where you been? Well, I've been searching to and fro, trying to find somebody I can devour. You know, I'm just doing my thing. That's what. Now, <laughs> just doing what I do, you know. Could you imagine if you walked into God's office and saw him sitting at a desk having a conversation with Satan? See, if you don't know any better, you would think, wait a minute, y'all together? Y'all must y'all on one accord? What's going on here? Because they were together in the same place does not necessarily mean they were all in accord. So in the church, there are some times when people will congregate and come together, and it looks like they're on one accord, but they're only just together. They're just together. They, they share different beliefs. They share different ideologies. They're, they're going in two different directions, but physically they're just in the same place. Hopefully y'all didn't miss that. God is saying, don't just come together. I need you to be on one accord. Y'all with me this morning? And so we have to come to this place because when we come together and not only just be physically together, but be on one accord, we have an opportunity to see God move. So why do we miss God? If, if, if the pastor is ready, and some of the leaders are ready, but some of the church members are not ready, or if the pastor's not ready, but the church members are ready, and some of the leaders are some ready and some not. So there's all kinds of dynamics in how we can miss God. But if everybody came together and said, I'm sold out for the cause, whatever it is to see God move, I'm all in. Having an entire body of people that's willing to say, I'm all in, not just on Sunday, but I'm all in on Monday. I'm all in on Tuesday. I'm all in on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yes, I'm all in for the call because I want to see God move that bad that I'm not going to put a start and stop time on when I'm committed. Opportunity. We have the stamina to do it. We just don't have the patience. We have the stamina to do it. We just don't have the desire. God created us to be on one accord. Have you guys ever in your life or in reading the text seen where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had to agree to disagree? Is it anywhere in the, in, the, in the scriptures where the Father had one idea, the Son had another idea, the Holy Spirit thought something else was much greater, and they just had to agree to disagree and just try to make it work? <laughs> never in the text, never in the scripture. They are all on one accord in everything they do. Jesus, when he came, he only spoke what his father told him to say. He didn't allow the pass on his back to get to his head and him start talking on his own. He said, I can only tell you what my father told me to say. It was all in unison. The Holy Spirit didn't just show up because he was excited and anxious to do something. He had to wait until Jesus left. And so everything was done perfectly and decent and in order. And because of that, everything that God does is perfect. Everything is perfect. But he created us the same way. He created us to work in unison. He created us to be in agreement. He created us. He gave us one word. But yet we have a million interpretations of one word. Right? Yeah. This is how we are, right? No, that's not what that means. It means this. No, it doesn't mean that. It means this. Oh, you know what? Forget y'all. I'm going to start my own church. <laughs> now we got a million churches on every corner because one scripture they didn't agree on. And they were ready to start a whole new religion. And, then, and I'm a part of an association, and we've actually had this conversation amongst it's a, a bunch of pastors here in, in Claremont. And there's certain topics that we, we discuss, some deep topics. We, we, we go hard, and, and we sit there for three hours, and we just kind of just praise God, but at the same time, we, we talk some tough stuff. And there are some topics that we all can find a scripture to validate how we feel about something. But then, you know, what? well, let's just agree to disagree. No, absolutely not. I, I'm the one that, no, I don't want to agree to disagree because the word of God is clear. And we're all pastors leading his flock. We should all be able to come to a consensus on what this word is saying for the people. Amen. I'm not going to just agree to disagree. Just, I want to just, just love one another. No, I'm, I'm beyond loving one another. I want to get some understanding so that we're not leading God's flock to the wrong place. Amen. And there's some tough topics. Come on, how many, how many of y'all know politics is a tough topic? Yeah. Oh, boy. 
I'm not going to go into details about it, but it's a tough topic. And pastors are in the forefront. We're in the fire about how to handle this particular topic. So that's one of the things that we sit down and we talk about. But yet, oh yeah, well we agree with this, don't agree with that. Yeah, well we agree with this, don't agree with that. Okay, so where do we meet in the middle where God's word is actually at? And then we all be on one accord with this is what God's heart is saying. It requires us to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well how much of this is just my flesh? That's on both sides of the table. How much of this is my flesh? And I just found a scripture to validate my flesh. We don't ever want to go that deep. So we say, let's just agree to disagree. But I've never seen the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do that. They always had one solution that worked. And I believe that there's always one solution that lines up with God's heart. And we can find it if we dig deep enough and allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough to say, you know what, I was wrong all this time. So oneness. This is what God is trying to do. This is why the power of God has not truly been demonstrated broadly because we have so many different churches and so many different pastors who, and people who don't believe on one accord. We have a lot of different mindsets, a lot of different ideologies, a lot of different uh, agendas. And it's keeping us from seeing the power of God move because we're not on one accord. And God is saying, if you just dig a little deeper and let's get into my, get into my word and let's get some understanding, some real understanding, allow your flesh to be put on the table so we can deal with that. But let's get an understanding because, see, when we get the understanding, we're all on one accord, we can have another Pentecost experience. He's not going to release his fiery tongue on a lion spirit. He's not going to release his anointing on someone who refuses to go deeper in his word. So let's get on one accord. This is what God is saying. This is where we have to be because unless we do that, I'll say it this way, until we do that, we won't reach this place of immunity. Immunity. See, it started with community. And, and when you master that, if you will, it progresses to opportunity. We get a chance to see God work. And when we see God at work in us, then we go to this place of immunity. And there's a scripture that helps tie it in Luke 10, 19. Behold! I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. Nothing. Absolutely nothing shall harm you. You cannot be sifted like wheat when you're in community. You cannot miss the move of God when you've experienced God and are constantly pursuing the next opportunity so that leaves us with the place of immunity. And here we are. The authority is in us, but we have no idea on how to operate in that authority except for our connectivity to the bodies of believers. We have to be together, y'all. We have to be together. Some people don't know how to pray nor what to pray because they're disconnected. Are you connected in your local church? Whatever the church is, wherever you are, are you connected in your local church? If somebody, a stranger, came up to you and said, hey, what church do you go to? We know you can tell the name of the church. Oh, right. But they say, well, what do you guys do throughout the week? Can you tell them what the activities are throughout the week? If they say, what is the vision of the church? Can you tell them the vision of the church? Well, what, what, tell me what type of ministry is it? Like, what, tell me about the pastor style of priesthood. Can you, can, are you able to tell them? Are you connected to your ministry to a point where if somebody asks you about the church or about the ministry, you're able to answer those questions? If not, I want to encourage you to be connected because that means that we're not connected. And how can we be on one accord if we're not connected? God wants to do a powerful work in every church that he has ordained and has allowed to start but we have to be connected. I don't, it doesn't matter if you, from the top to the bottom, we all have to be on one accord. And I'm not saying you got to go out and say, hey, I want to be a pastor. I want to be a prophet. I want to be an evangelist. I'm not saying you got to do any of those things. I'm just saying just be connected. What's the vision of this church, pastor? I need to know. So that way I know how to pray. That way I know how to position myself. And I know that when you call and say, hey, I'm calling fast or I'm calling, you know, I'm just looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all know how that goes, right? Pass the of ass, like, man, you guys, man. This is all this food, right, mother? <laughs> but in itself, isn't that not division, though? Is that a lack of unity? 
if, if, if we're in a place where, again, God is teaching us how to, to, to honor positions and honor titles and honor, the, you know, this, that whole little pretty stuff. But if he's teaching us how to do that, he says, how can you honor me who you have not seen if you can't honor someone who you have? So if you pass the stall in the fast, support with that. Because he's heard from God. He says, this is the season to do it. If he's saying, hey, we need to meet up and do X, Y, Z. And can we do that on Sunday? We can't, we can't do that. Can we short the service and then squeeze it in before 1.15? If he said, no, 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 God is saying we need to be at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. I need y'all to be there. No, 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 y'all do that. Y'all go ahead and do that. I just, y'all tell me about it. Right? So what that's showing is that there's a disconnect between that individual and the ministry. There's a disconnect between that person and the pastor. Now, how can God do a mighty work in a ministry where people utilize their own interests as a tool to separate themselves from what God is trying to do within the ministry that they support? So God is saying we have to come back to this place where we recognize that excuses will keep him outside of the door. It will. It'll keep him outside the door because he, there was no excuses in the, in the Pentecost experience. There were people who didn't know what to expect, but they showed up because they knew something was going to happen. They showed up and then God showed up. And so this is the thing. When we're on one accord, God can do great and mighty things. But if we're not on one accord, we can summon his presence with praise and worship. And he'll show up because we're doing that. But when it comes time to the, the next level. When it comes time, okay, God, I'm, I'm believing you for this next thing. I'm believing you to do a great thing in this situation. Well, let's, let's take a look at your track record. Are you, are you submissive to your leadership? Are you on one accord with the ministry that you're in? Are you obedient to whatever it is that I'm calling? Because obedience is greater than sacrifice. Are you obedient to the things that have been placed before you? Are you faithful? If not, then even though I'm moving in this season, I don't have anything for you because you haven't been obedient where you were. So we all have a story, and God has something for all of us. And I want the reason why I decided to do this message because I had something totally different in mind. The reason why I do this message is I don't want anybody here to miss what God has for them because we didn't have this discussion. This is more of a discussion than it is anything else. Because I want to make sure that you don't miss what God has for you. Walk in unity. Walk in unity, not just with people that you like. Walk in unity with the body of Christ as a whole. Because what that does is it's principles behind it that you understand in Scripture. There's principles behind walking in unity that God wants us to have so that way when he releases his blessings to us, everything falls in line. And I'm going to close here because I, I, wanna, um, I don't want to give you too much to deal with. Where is your place in your church. So just think about it. You don't have to answer, you don't have to have an answer, but it's just something I want you to go home and think about. Where is your place in your church? We all agree that the church is not about the four walls, but yet that's the only place where 90% of believers are willing to participate. Right? If I say, is the church about the four walls? Everyone will say, no, it's not about the four walls. It's about this, that, and that. But 90% of believers are only willing to participate within the four walls. <clears throat> so my question for everyone is, where is your place in the church? What, your affiliates, whatever ministry that you call your current home, because you were led there. God led you there. And if you were led there, you have purpose there. And if you haven't had a conversation with your pastor, to help you find your purpose and how you can fulfill your purpose within that ministry, I urge you to be proactive in it. If you don't have a home church, this can be your home church. You don't have to live here to be a part of this ministry. We're in the RV community. 90% of people we meet don't live here. Well, I'll say 95, maybe 99%. <laughs> Almost 100%, 99.8%. Don't live here. But if you don't have a church home and you know that you want to have like a, a spiritual uh, advisor, a pastor, someone that, a place that you can say, this, this is my church home, this can be it. Because we have a lot of people that have come through and gone that still stay in touch with us over the last couple of years, and they call this their home. And they live in Minnesota, they live in California, all over the place, and they call this their home. And so this is, if that's something you want to do, then we'll give you the opportunity today. But 
if you, if you do have a church home, I want to urge and encourage you to, to connect with your pastor. Say, hey, listen, I'm here for a reason. I don't know what it is, but help me figure it out. So that way I can be on one accord with the vision of your ministry. Amen? Amen. All right, all right. Well, this is what we're going to do. Um, I want to give somebody an opportunity. If this is you, and you say, you know what, I do want to be a part of a church, and I don't have one, I wouldn't mind being connected. I'm not asking you to put any um, anything major other than just we'll talk after service, and I'll show you um, how you can stay connected to us. But also, I want to allow this as an opportunity for us to pray. If there's anyone here today that needs prayer, maybe something that was said today convicted you a little bit. You know what? Yeah, I've been a little selfish in my walk. I've been a little uh, disconnected. I've been, you know, whatever it may be, and I, I realize now that I need to get myself in the will of God. I need to make sure that I'm in the right place. So if, you, if, you, if that's you and you want somebody to pray for you, just stay where you are, just raise your hand, and I'll pray for you before we dismiss. Amen. 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 Okay, I got you. All right. Yes, amen. 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 God's good. Now, if there's anyone here today that has been going to church for years, maybe you stopped, maybe you're still going, whatever the case may be, and, and you've been going to church, but you've never really dedicated and given your life to the Lord, you've never made the verbal confession. Because the Bible says that not only do we believe in our heart, but we also confess with our mouth. Those are two parts to our salvation. Maybe you've never done that before. And today's your day where you say, you know what? I need that coverage. I need, I need the Lord. Uh, I need that salvation. I need that in my life. I don't have it. Yes, I've been going to church, but I, there's something. I don't have the Holy Spirit because I've never given my life to the Lord. If that is you today. You can do it right now. If you just want to raise your hand, you don't have to get up and, and run laps. You don't have to do anything spectacular. But if you just raise your hand, then we can do that today as well. Is there anyone here that has never given their life to the Lord and want to do that today? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to pray for those who uh, have raised their hand. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the way. Put all eyes closed, please. Hallelujah. Most righteous Father, we just thank you for this time today. Thank you for this teaching moment, Lord. I know that there are times that we would love to be able to um, get an exciting, jumping word and be able to just praise you and, and go crazy. But there are some times, Lord, where we just need to be taught and we just need to have conversations. So I thank you for the word that went forward today. And I thank you that it, it pierced the hearts and convicted those that were in the sound of my voice, Lord. And I pray that you will just continue to speak with them on how they could, um, first of all, draw closer to you and find what their purpose is and find out what their objective is, what it is you want them to do, Lord God. And I pray that you make it very clear and that, that you would put it on their hearts, Lord God, to, to, to be so inquisitive that they go and ask whoever their spiritual leader is and they will go and have a conversation with them on, on how to do it. Because sometimes it's not one thing to just get an answer, but another way we need to know how to go about doing it. So Lord, I pray that you would move in their lives so that the very jewel that you have hidden in their hearts, Lord God, can be revealed and that it can be utilized to further your kingdom here on earth because it is valuable, Lord God. They've been counted in your number as someone who has purpose, as someone who has a destiny, and someone that you want to, uh, to utilize for your glory. So I pray that you make it clear today uh, so that they can move in the right direction that you have for them. And that's my prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Give God some praise, y'all. Um, 